All right, welcome back. <clears throat> Before we get down to business, I need to take a selfie. Everybody smile. Say Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, before I get into the meat of everything, I, w I needed to uh, give a, a brief advertising testimonial uh, for my blog, The Deacon's Bench. Dot com. If anybody uh, is not familiar with it, that's, that's where you can find me almost every day. I post stuff and I have been doing it ever since I was ordained. I started it just a couple of weeks after I was ordained in 2007 and it's still going strong. TheDeaconsBench.com And I post news of the church, I post homilies, I post tidbits of this and that. I try and put things up every day. And I also wanted to mention one of the things that I'm promoting, and they're one of the advertisers, uh, you'll find them on the back of your prayer brochure, is Select International Tours. I am going to be leading a pilgrimage with them to the Holy Land next May, the last two weeks of May. And there's lots of information on my blog uh, that will link you to the itinerary and where we're going and what we're doing. It was a phenomenal experience. We, I led a pilgrimage in March, just this past March, 11 days. We had 23 people. It was the trip of a lifetime. My wife and I have made this trip before, but this was so much more rewarding and so much richer. Um, the last time we did this in 2000, we were changing hotels almost every day, and it was relentless. Here we only changed hotels twice. We had 23 people, so it was a small, intimate group. There were a number of deacons, and we all took turns preaching at all the different liturgies. And one of the liturgies we did was in the Edicule, in the Holy Sepulcher, which is literally at the tomb of Jesus. Uh, they only allow 30 people in there. I think they have three masses a day. And we were the first mass at 6 a.m. And it was an experience I will never forget. I will carry that with me the rest of my life. Being able to serve at the altar over the burial spot of Jesus was just extraordinary. We also walked the way of the cross, Via Dolorosa, at 5 in the morning, just before this, which sounds horrible. <laughs> Everybody in our group was saying, oh, I don't want to get up at 3.30 to do that. But it was stunning. It was haunting, it was beautiful, and there was no one around. It was, it was meditative, it was really very beautiful. So if you're interested, it's gonna be the last two weeks of May, uh, next year, 2024, and you can find information about it at thedeaconsbench.com. The other thing I wanted to mention is on Facebook, uh, a friend of mine during COVID started up a Facebook page for deacons called The Deacons Page. And I'm one of the moderators of it. We now have over 3,000 deacons who are members of it. It's for deacons, deacon candidates, and their spouses. So I encourage you to check that out. It's on Facebook, The Deacons Page. And it's a great gathering place to talk about our ministry and the challenges we're facing to ask questions, get some answers, and get to learn about the diaconate in other parts of the country and really other parts of the world. So I encourage you to check that out also. And uh, we had some technical difficulties in the last go around. My, my ace multimedia guy, James, assures me things have been fixed. When I was working at CBS, whenever there was a technical glitch, the producer would always say, well, gee, it was fine when it left here. <laughs> It was fine when it left here, so <laughs> hopefully we've got all that straightened out, and you will see slides uh, for this whole presentation. Anyway, welcome back. We cannot talk about becoming what we receive without considering our desire to become Christ the servant. This is intrinsic to our call as deacons. 
Diaconia means service, and daily in our vocation, we seek to live out the words of Jesus, I have come not to be served, but to serve. A few years ago, a Catholic newspaper that shall remain nameless, but some of you may be familiar with this, did a big, beautiful spread on the ordination of deacons in the diocese, and it was remarkable for a diocesan paper to give this much attention to it. It's an event that very often gets overlooked. Well, the center spread of the paper had a dozen or so beautifully photographed images of the ordination, and in the middle was this quote in big, bold type. <laughs> well, that did not go over very well. <laughs> The editor came very close to losing his job. <laughs> there were a lot of apologies to deacons, to readers, to everyone who attended the ordination, all the readers of the newspaper. It was something to behold, and it was a reminder to us all, everybody needs a proofreader. <laughs> but looking back on it now, maybe what seemed to be a horrible mistake was in fact saying something that we can often forget. Because when you think about it, Christ did come to be served, to be blessed, broken, and shared. He came in part to be received in our bodies and into our hearts. He came to be placed into a ciborium and given to the poor, weak, struggling sinners like ourselves. And then, of course, it is up to us to carry him to others, to serve him to others, to our own lives. We become what we receive, people who serve and who serve Jesus to a hungry world. How are we doing that? St. Paul had this advice, writing from prison to the Christians at Philippi. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Look to the interests of others. Be there to serve. My friend and a friend of Endice, Deacon Bill Dightwig, has just published a wonderful book called Courageous Humility, essentially calling on all of us to serve one another as humble stewards of the faith. And he makes this observation. The church must continually recognize that service is not merely something the individual Christian does for someone else. It is precisely who we are. Service is not an activity as much as it is a state of being and a frame of reference. Servanthood is the distinguishing characteristic of what it means to be the Christian church in the world. The servant church must have a different way of looking at and interacting with the world around us. It must have, in the words of Pope Paul VI and John Paul II, a novus habitus mentis a new horizon of meaning, the eyes, hands, heart, and soul of a servant. I've often said it, and you've probably heard it too, being a deacon isn't about what you do, but about who you are. It is an attitude. It is a way of looking at the world and living in it, and somehow by the grace of God, witnessing Christ's love to those in need. It is not just becoming what we receive, but modeling the one we have received in our lives and giving him to others. Pope Francis talked about this recently in his homily at a Eucharistic Congress in Italy. The Eucharist calls us to the love of the brothers. This bread is the sacrament of love par excellence. It is Christ who offers himself and breaks for us 
and asks us to do the same so that our life may be ground wheat and become bread that feeds our brothers. And the Holy Father offered this beautiful reflection. Brothers and sisters, he said, we dream. We dream of a church like this, a Eucharistic church, made of men and women who break like bread for all of those who feed on loneliness and poverty, for those who are hungry for tenderness and compassion, for those whose life is crumbling because the good leaven of hope has failed. I dream of a church that kneels before the Eucharist and adores with wonder the Lord present in the bread, but who also knows how to bend with compassion and tenderness before the wounds of those who suffer, relieving the poor, drying the tears of those who suffer, making themselves bread of hope and joy for all. Isn't that what it means to become what we receive? It takes trust, it takes faith, and it takes a sense of surrender. Very often God is telling us to be prepared, to expect the unexpected. I can tell you I learned that in my own life. Last thing I ever expected was to one day be ordained to holy orders. I was what you might call a good enough Catholic. For over 40 years, I did all the things that I was supposed to do. I went to mass, received the sacraments, dropped the envelope in the collection basket every week, and then went on with my life. I skated by. But then came 9-11. I was working for CBS News at that time in New York, just four miles north of the Twin Towers. In the morning it happened, I could see the smoke from my office window. I spent that day in the newsroom writing special reports while we stayed on the air all day and all night, finally signing off at one o'clock the next morning. And when we signed off, I was unable to get home to our apartment in Queens. All the bridges and tunnels were closed, all the subways and trains had stopped running. So CBS ended up putting us up in a hotel in Midtown, and around 1.30 in the morning, a group of us walked half a mile or so to where the hotel was, and I remember going down West 57th Street in the middle of the night. There was no traffic. The street lights were blinking. And on every corner, there was a soldier. I remember crossing Broadway and looking south to Times Square, 10 blocks below us, and being stunned because it was pitch black. All the lights in Times Square had been turned off because they thought there was going to be another attack. It was the first time they had done that since World War II. Well, days and weeks passed, and the story didn't end. Funerals went on and the grieving never stopped. After a few days, you would see the flyers taped to lampposts and bus stops, pictures of husbands and wives, sons and daughters, with the words missing. Have you seen her come home? All of it forced me to look at my life in a new way a life that had experienced tremendous success and had accumulated lots of stuff, stuff that I realized could be gone in a heartbeat. And I asked myself, what am I doing? How am I spending the life that God gave me? The life that could be snuffed out in an instant. What has all this been for? Is there something else? And as the months went on, I found myself listening for God's answer and praying for it. Did he have a plan for me? Well, the answer was yes. Six years after the towers fell, I found myself where I never expected to be, face down on the floor of a basilica, 
our choir chanted the litany of the saints. And I was ordained. And I got up from the floor to approach the bishop and my cheeks were streaked with tears. I couldn't believe this was happening. The morning after my ordination, when I gave my first homily, I spoke of the surprising turn that my life had taken. And I quoted a familiar Jewish proverb, if you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. Being ordained was never in my plans, and I can assure you it was never in my wife's plans. But it was in God's. At a key moment in my life, I asked, what does God need from me? And listening for the answer changed everything. He needed me to let go and trust. And as a result, here I am in Fairview Heights, Illinois. Our God is a God of astonishment. Plans can and do change. And I would offer this piece of advice. When we consider how we become what we receive, how we have become people who serve, men blessed with this astonishing vocation, take time every day to remember how your vocation began. Remember the seeds of faith that grew into this incredible garden of ministry and sacrifice and service. Remember the people who walked with you on this journey. Remember the people whose names you don't even know. People who prayed you to that moment when you were ordained and who are walking with you now. Friends, parents, grandparents, guardian angels, saints who gently pulled you to holy orders. Somewhere in India, there is a humble nun on her knees praying for vocations. You are an answer to her prayer. Pray for her. Pray for all who are praying for us. Life is so often like a chain of dominoes, one after another falling into a surprising shape. Look back when you can on all the dominoes that fell that seemed so random, so accidental, but remember that with God there are no accidents. People, events, and choices were placed in our lives for a reason. As one of my mentors liked to say, God has a dream for you, and your job is to figure out what that is, how to make that dream come true. It might not be what you expected, which brings me to an important icon of service for all of us to consider, someone I've become very close to lately, St. Joseph. Last spring, I published a book about St. Joseph, reflecting on his life. There's a lot about him, of course, that we don't know, but what we do know has a lot to teach us, especially those of us who feel called to a life of service, a life of letting God take charge. Joseph was a master at the art of just letting go. We tend to think of Joseph as this strong, silent, mysterious figure, a statue on a side altar, a spectator, really, to the greatest story ever told. But that misses the reality that he was a man very much like us, flawed, imperfect, seeking to find his way in the world and to follow the plans of God. He surrendered everything to make that happen. When we consider becoming what we receive and becoming men who serve, we have much to learn not only from Jesus Christ, but from the man who helped raise him, Joseph. In the way he served God and served as a model for the boy he raised to, into a man, he has much to teach us about sacrifice and surrender and selflessness. Think of the plans that Joseph must have had and how God completely turned them upside down. Do you think Joseph ever expected to marry a pregnant virgin? 
Do you think he ever expected to watch the Savior of the world being born in a stable? Do you think he ever imagined fleeing with his family to Egypt, running for their lives to become refugees in a foreign land? Joseph probably imagined just having his quiet little carpenter shop in a forgotten corner of Galilee. But then God laughed. And Joseph became part of our salvation history. And it happened in part because he let go. He let go of his own plans. He let go of his anxieties and fears. He let go of what he wanted and embraced what God wanted. To quote, quote a familiar saying from AA, he let go and let God. All that takes more than trust and surrender. It also takes courage. Do not be afraid. It takes courage. Thinking about St. Joseph, three decades after Joseph trusted and let go, 30 years after he took the advice of angels, a generation after he went where he never expected to go and found safety in Egypt, Jesus, the boy that Joseph raised, would give this advice, his first words of wisdom to the fishermen who would follow him. Put out into the deep. In his way, Joseph did that. Mary did that. They went where the water was dark and the current was unpredictable. They went where they couldn't see the bottom. They went where it seemed dangerous. They risked. But they also went with those words ringing in their ears, do not be afraid. I don't think it's a coincidence that so often we encounter Joseph on a journey to Bethlehem, to Egypt, back to Nazareth, to Jerusalem. He was a man on a mission and a man on a journey, a journey of faith, hope, and love, like all of us. He has a lot to teach us about service, and so does his adopted son. Jesus, after all, showed us how it's done. I have given you a model, he told his apostles on the last night of his earthly life. On that night, God got down on his knees for us. He gave himself as bread for us. And the next day, he opened his arms on the cross for us. And then he came back to remind us, death isn't the end of the story. An important part of that story, the Christian story, the story of every one of us, is how we serve one another. He has given us a model to follow. How do we, becoming what we receive, become servants to each other? Martin Luther King Jr. once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Not long after I first moved to New York, I was working in Manhattan for CBS, and my wife asked me to stop at a bagel shop, H&H Bagels, on the way home from work. They are, without question, the best bagels in the world. <laughs> Certainly the best in New York City. They only have a couple of shops left, and they have a thriving mail order business. But my wife asked me if I could pick up a dozen bagels on the way home from work, so I went and I stopped at their shop. Anyway, they used to offer them on sale half price after four o'clock. So I went after work, I got a bag, and I went down to the subway station to take the subway back to Queens. The bagels were still warm, and they smelled incredible. I went to get a fare card, and there was a homeless guy standing by the window of the token booth. He was small and old and filthy, and he had a little cardboard cup. And I thought, great, just what I need. I almost always try to avoid these people when I'm on the subway. But I had an idea, and I looked at him and I said, would you like a bagel? And his face lit up, 
like I was offering him a sirloin steak. And he said, yeah. So I gave it to him, and he was overjoyed. And I was feeling so proud of myself and my generosity. I was Francis of Assisi, <laughs> kissing the hands of the leper, giving this guy a bagel. I felt so unbelievably holy. And I went through the turnstiles and waited on the platform. My train came, and I looked for my homeless guy. Suddenly, he was my homeless guy. I was very possessive of him, and I couldn't see him. So my eyes went down to the end of the platform, and I realized he'd walked down there to another old homeless guy who was sitting on the ground. And my homeless guy took the bagel I had given him and broke it in half and gave it to his friend. Well, my train came and I got on and I watched them eating the bagel as the train pulled out of the station. I had never felt more moved or more humbled. I had thought myself so generous and so thoughtful. And yet a man who had next to nothing gave half of what he had to someone who had even less. Besides being a lesson in humility, and generosity, showing me very graphically what it means to love thy neighbor. That moment was profoundly Eucharistic. It was Emmaus in a subway station. I saw something of Jesus there in that moment in the breaking of the bread. I'll never forget it. And for whatever reason, my eyes were opened to something wondrous and beautiful. I thank God for that moment. This happened long before I ever considered the diaconate or felt like I had any vocation, but God was planting one of those seeds. You know, we heard all about the, the planting of seeds on Sunday. Well, this was one of those. You want to see Christ the servant? Here's another morsel of wisdom for you. Look in places you might not have expected. I saw Jesus in a homeless man breaking bread. If he can do it, so can I. Several years ago, Time Magazine published a special issue to mark the 100th birthday of Mother Teresa. And I had the chance to interview the author, David Van Bema. He's not Catholic, but he had a great respect for Mother Teresa and have written a lot about her life. After the interview, I asked him to autograph the magazine for me. And he said, sure. And he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a rubber stamp, and he stamped the inside of the magazine. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's a jip. <laughs> and then he took out a pen, and he signed his name. And I looked at what he had stamped. Stamp had five words. You did this. For me. He said that was what Mother Teresa said again and again. Whenever anyone would ask for some small bit of wisdom or advice, she would take their hand and touch each finger and say, you have the gospel in your hand. You did this for me. Remember that. Share that. Teach that. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. What are we doing to share the gospel in our hand? What are we doing for those who have no voice? What are we doing for those who have been silenced? What are we doing for those who are helpless or feel hopeless? They may be poor, hungry, abandoned. They may be men, women, and children of Ukraine suffering as I speak. They may be even closer to home, in our own backyard. Mother Teresa understood that. Very often, people would show up at her headquarters in Calcutta after traveling from the United States, and they would say, hi, I'm here to help the poor. What can I do? And she would look at them and say very simply, you don't need to be here. Find your own Calcutta. Calcutta is everywhere. It's in New York, 
It's in Beverly Hills. It is in Fairview Heights, Illinois. It can be anywhere. And it is not just a place where people are hungry or living in the gutters or battling leprosy. There are many kinds of poverty and hunger, and there are many kinds of Calcuttas. What is yours? Where do you find it? Last year, I spoke at a convocation of priests in Cleveland, and I asked them this question. Where is your Calcutta? And I asked them to break up into groups and talk about it. And I got some beautiful answers of how they are ministering to people in need. And many of them with young people, particularly young people who are struggling with sexual issues or gender issues and trying to reach out and minister to them in a loving, supportive way. That is a kind of Calcutta. What is your Calcutta in your neighborhood, in your community, even in your family? The question we need to ask ourselves as deacons and as Christians, what are people hungering for in your world? Where is the poverty? How can we serve them? How can we bring them the gospel in our hearing? How can we become for them what we have received? A little while ago, I spoke about the role that 9-11 played in my own vocation. It has been said that we now live in the world of 9-12. It is perennially the day after. I want to leave you with some words from 9-10, September the 10th, 2001. That day, a new firehouse in the Bronx was dedicated. And the chaplain was there to offer a blessing and say a few words. The chaplain was Father Michael Judge. The next day, he would become the first official fatality of 9-11. This was his last homily. He was speaking to firefighters about what it means to be a firefighter, but I think he was also speaking about being a servant a priest, a minister, a deacon, a faithful Christian trying to serve others, about being bound by grace and bonded to Christ. In so many ways, this is what it means to be people who serve. And these words call us to do it with great joy. This goes to the heart of who we are. He began with a prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for life. Thank you for love. Thank you for goodness. Thank you for work. Thank you for family. Thank you for friends. Thank you for every gift, because we know that every gift comes from you, and without you we have and are nothing. And so as we celebrate this day in thanksgiving to you, keep our hearts and minds open. Let us enjoy each other's company, and most of all, let us be conscious of your presence in our lives and in a special way lives of all those who have gone before us. And Father, we make our prayer as always in Jesus' name, who lives with you forever and ever. And then he went on. That's the way it is. Good days, bad days, up days, down days, sad days, happy days, but never a boring day on this job. You do what God has called you to do, You show up, you put one foot in front of another, you get on the rig and you go out and you do the job, which is a mystery and a surprise. You have no idea when you get on that rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small. You have no idea what God is calling you to. But he needs you. He needs me. He needs all of us. The retiree, he needs your prayers. He needs your stopping by occasionally to give strength and support and to tell the stories of the old days. We need the house, and to those of you that are working now, keep going. Keep supporting each other. Be kind to each other. Love each other. Work together and do what you did the other night and in the weeks and months and years before, and from this house, God's blessings go forth in this community. It's fantastic. What great people.
We love the job, we all do. What a blessing that is. A difficult job and God calls you to it and then he gives you a love for it so that a difficult job will be well done. Isn't he a wonderful God? Isn't he good to you? To each of you and to me. Turn to him each day. Put your faith and your trust and your hope and your life in his hands and he will take care of you and you will have a good life. Amen. Carry that in your hearts this week and long after. May each of us become enriched by the Eucharist we receive to become what we receive. People who pray, people who serve, people compelled to share that wonder and joy with others, people who love without limits, people who become Christ to a needy, lonely, hungry world. Thank you, and God bless you now.